Good morning. Well, that was kind of subdued. Good morning. We just talked about being, you know, unashamed in here. You can say it loud. You don't have to say it in harmony. That's okay. We're going to turn our attention this morning to Paul's letter to the Romans in the 15th chapter. We're going to pick up reading in the 4th verse. And Paul writes these words to us. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. And again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again it says, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Accept one another, even as Jesus Christ has accepted you. Now, acceptance is one of those buzzwords in our culture right now. It's one of those words that when you hear it, you immediately have some kind of response. Uh, you, you, you're for it. You think it's gone too far. You think it hasn't gone far enough. It's like one of those words, tolerance. We want to have a tolerant society. And as soon as you hear that word, uh, you, you have your opinion and you have your reaction. And it, it energizes and creates a passion for you to get in on that conversation. Inclusion is another one of those words. We, we want to belong to organizations that are inclusive. We don't want to belong to organizations or groups of people that, that keep people on the outside and say, No, you can't be part of us. We want to be inclusive. And we could spend the rest of the morning arguing amongst ourselves what those words mean and how far they should go and do they have any boundaries at all, but I don't want to do that. Instead, I want you to think about those words, acceptance and inclusion and tolerance and the whole discussion in our society, and I want you to now compare that to what Jesus says in the Bible. Because nowhere in the Bible did Jesus encourage us to be tolerant. Nowhere in the Bible did Jesus encourage us to be inclusive. The word's just not there. Instead, Jesus called us to something deeper. Something more meaningful. Something more transformational. Something that would change me and would change you. Jesus didn't talk about tolerating one another or including one another. Instead, he told us to love one another. Love your neighbor. Henri, crabby, plays that loud music, doesn't mow his lawn, <laughs> does all those things that irritate you, bother you, aggravate you. Love your neighbor just as much as you love yourself. Didn't say tolerate your neighbor. It didn't say include your neighbor in a few neighborhood activities. He said, love him. He went so far as to say, love your enemies. He asked us to go to a much deeper level of commitment, one with another. He asked us not to just say, okay, I guess I'll tolerate you. No, I will give my heart to you. I will love you as best I can in the power that God provides. And nobody said that was easy. Nobody said it was a piece of cake. It's just the call and it's the direction that Jesus wants the people of God to be moving towards, to love one another. Paul goes uh, and grasps a concept of that in this letter to the Romans when he says, accept one another as the Lord Jesus Christ has accepted you. 
Paul understood that there was always some tension in the church, as maybe you picked up in that lesson, that Jews and Gentiles didn't get along. The Jewish Christians weren't really crazy about including the Gentile Christians in their congregation, but the Gentile Christians weren't really all that crazy. They weren't on fire to include those Jewish segments of the church. And Paul said, no, let's all get together. Accept one another just as the Lord Jesus Christ has accepted you. But we have to ask ourselves, what is Paul asking us to do when he asks us to accept one another? And we'll give you your little Greek lesson for today because the word that's translated accept here is translated in other versions as welcome or receive or even embrace one another. Pros lambano. Now you can go to lunch with the ladies on Tuesday and say, you know, I was thinking we need to practice more pro slumbano in our group. See, and they'll go, ooh, wow. <laughs> comes from two words. It's a compound word. comes from pros and lambano. Pros means alongside. Lambano means to bring or to take. Acceptance, welcoming, receiving, embracing is bringing someone alongside you and bringing them into your life. It's bringing that person into your heart. It's not about tolerating them. We can tolerate a lot of things, but we can tolerate a lot of people and never bring them into our life. We can include a lot of people in the congregation. We can get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That doesn't mean that we pro slumbano them. That doesn't mean that we welcome them into our lives, into our hearts. That doesn't mean that our relationship changes me and it changes you because love has brought us together. This is what God is calling us to do, to come alongside. Now, he recognizes, you know, that we all need our space today. Hey, don't invade my space. Jesus is saying through the word today, no, you got to get them through your space and into your life. I don't know if you're like me, but, you know, I have a comfort zone. And if you get too close and you get too involved in my life, uh, you begin to invade my comfort zone. Uh, Lynn's allowed in there. She's my wife. Uh, Mom and dad are allowed in there. Uh, kids, grandkids. But you, don't get, you know, don't invade my comfort zone. Jesus is saying, no, bring them alongside. Get them past the comfort zone. So heart to heart, we make a connection. Just as God got past his need for space, or God got past his need for comfort, the creator embraces and receives and welcomes the creature. He loves you and welcomes you into his life, and he wants to be in your life. This is what Paul is asking us to do. This is the challenge that he's giving to you and to me. But let's be very careful that we understand who is he asking us to accept. And if you're following me on the outline in your worship folder, then make a good and a happy note here. Put a little happy face by it. God is not asking you to accept sinners. God is not asking you to welcome the broken or the evil or the wicked into your life. He's not asking you to embrace those that bring pain and misery and ugliness to people around them. He's not asking you to do that. You don't have to embrace sinners. He specifically says, accept, embrace, receive, welcome each other. The children of God. You can embrace the children of God. They have the Spirit of God within them. The Spirit of God that helps them change their lives and, and turn away from these ugly things in life. You can embrace the children of God because they have the love of God in their life. You don't have to embrace the sinners or the broken or the wicked or the evil or the hurtful. That's not what he said. Accept each other. The ones that Christ has accepted. The believers, the Christians. The problem here is, there are times you don't see me as a child of God. You don't see me as a spirit-filled new creation in Christ. You see me as a sinner. Because you remember the sin in my life. 
And when you remember that moment of brokenness or pain or shame or disappointment between us, when that is what you remember and that's how you define me, I'm the person who did that. I'm the person, I'm the source of the pain in your life. I'm the one who disappointed you. When I'm not a child of God, but I'm a sinner, then you have all the reasons and the justifications and the explanations and all the excuses you need to not embrace me. You don't have to accept me because I'm sinful and I'm a sinner and I've proven that to you by what I did, what I didn't do, what I said, what I didn't say. And so you can exclude me. You do that in your marriage, don't you? She does something, he does something, they don't do something, say the wrong thing, and there's a moment of sin and a moment of pain and a moment of brokenness. And you don't see them as a child of God. You don't see them through the eyes of Christ. You now see them through the pain. You see them through the shame and the guilt and the disappointment and the frustration and the anger that they brought into your life. And because you now see them and you are hanging on to their sin, even if it's just for a few minutes, now you don't have to embrace them. You don't have to welcome them into your life. You can exclude them. You can keep them at a distance because they're sinful. And you do that for minutes, or hours, days, weeks, months. I'm going to guess there are some of us here that have siblings that we don't get along with, and we haven't for quite a while. Something happened while we were growing up. Something happened last year, whenever it was, and you're hanging on to it. That's how you see them. That's how you define them. You see them through the filter of that pain, through that brokenness, through that evil, through that wickedness, through whatever it is that they did or didn't do. And since that's who they are in your eyes, they're sinners and you don't have to embrace them and you haven't for a while. Mom and dad, they weren't perfect. They did some wrong things, maybe some terribly wrong things. That's how you define them, and that's how you'll always see them. The problem is with your reasons and your excuses and your justifications. Paul went on to say, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. Jesus Christ has stepped into our lives with all that we are and all that we've done and all of our brokenness and all of our pain and all of the shame and the guilt, all of the disappointment that we've brought to Him and He washes us clean in the blood He sheds at Calvary. He separates our sin from us as far as the East is from the West. He promised us in the Word that He not only would forgive our wickedness but He would remember it no more. That filter is gone for him. He can only see you through the blood. He can only see you through grace. And he only sees the child of God. He can't see the sin. He can't see the brokenness. He doesn't remember what you did or you didn't do. All of that has been washed away. And when he sees you, he sees you as the children of God. And as any father loves to come and embrace his children. So God wants to embrace you and pro Slumbano receive you into his life and receive you into his heart and he wants you to receive him in kind and you are desperate for God to love you and to forgive you and to wash you clean and you rejoice that's why you're here today that's why your kids are in school here because you want everybody to know this message of grace and mercy and forgiveness everybody except them. Love them as He loves you. Forgive them as He forgives you. Let it go. He let it go.
welcome them. In some cases, welcome them back. Just as he welcomes us back again and again and again and again. Don't hang on to the old me. The old me is forgiven. The old me is gone. I've been washed clean and made new in the blood of the Lamb. I am a new creation. Love the new me. And the new me will love you back. And God will make me new every day. Ask yourself one last question this morning. Who would you leave out of this embrace? Who doesn't deserve this? Now I know, you know, this is church. <laughs> it's Sunday morning. It's the getting towards the end of the sermon. I'm almost done. Hang in there with me. And so we all know what the right answer to that question is, right? I mean, if I asked you to write it down, sign your name, and turn it in, you'd all give me the right answer. And that right answer is nobody. See, nobody should be left out of the grace of God. Nobody should be left out of his embrace. Everyone should be embraced by the gospel. And that's the right answer. It's not necessarily your answer. Because I'm going to guess when I asked you that question, there were some of us in the sanctuary this morning that a name came to your heart. A name came to your mind. Because you can't get past that pain. You can't get past that brokenness. You will, at least to this moment, always define them by that experience. And a name came to your mind. Now let me ask you this. If I was to go to that person and ask them the same question, who, if anybody, should be left out of the embrace of Jesus Christ, would your name come to their mind? Would they exclude you? Would they want you out of the kingdom of God? Wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor. I'm the victim here. They're the offender. Maybe so. Maybe so. But they see you as unforgiving. Merciless. Ungracious. Unloving. You can't. And you won't forgive them. So, should we empower them to leave you out of the kingdom? Should we empower you to leave them out of the kingdom? Uh, do we get to decide who's beyond the grace of God? Who, who can't be forgiven? Who shouldn't be welcomed? This is why you don't get to answer that question. Neither do I. And this is why they don't get to answer this question. This is why there's only one person that gets to answer that question, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus' answer as to who could he embrace, who could he accept, who could he welcome, who could he love, who could he forgive, his answer was to open his arms and embrace a world. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, this is tough stuff. Some of these wounds are deep, and they're ugly, and they're raw, and it's just not that easy to move on. We cannot and we will not unless the Spirit of God moves in our hearts and in our lives. We don't want to harbor this. We don't want to hang on to this. But it is so hard to let it go. Lead us by your spirit to a cross. And let us watch our Savior die. It is not easy to die for the sins of the world. It is not easy to die and bring healing. It's not easy to reconcile a broken and ugly humanity with a perfect and a just God. But he hangs there, and he bleeds, and he dies, and he makes it so. 
May that blood flow over us and forgive us and cleanse us and make us new. May it change our hearts that we might receive and welcome and embrace all the children of God as he has embraced us. In Jesus' name, amen.